roads that are still untraveled. Many are the gifts that we share, many burdens we bear, many mysteries still unraveled. Many gifts, one spirit of love, one spirit. Some the preachers of love, some the fathers and some the mothers. Some will be the ones who will care, some will listen and share, serving God as they said. Well, we're standing side by side 
we'll be standing side by side It doesn't matter if you're left or right If we're both on the side of love In the magic of the chance we share We can take this feeling in Hey everybody, my name is Eric Nance Whaler. I am, uh, I live in Madisonville, Kentucky. I'm part of two churches, two disciples congregations in Madisonville. I'm part of First Christian Church Disciples of Christ of Madisonville. And I'm also part of a new church, a new congregation in, uh, in Madisonville called Potluck Church. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be able to, to, to talk with you all today. And we've got uh, uh, five church planters with us to kind of, um, to, to be able to talk about their callings and, and, and the ministries that they're a part of in their towns across Kentucky. And uh, though the, the, the goal here is really to uh, hopefully uh, to kind of inspire you, to inspire uh, folks who are, are joining the call, joining the recording uh, uh, with the regional assembly and um, to hopefully that you'll feel inspired to kind of look, if you're feeling called toward new church ministry, um, if you feel like God has something new for you in, in your context, uh, to take those next steps. And uh, maybe you'll hear a little bit of yourself and the way that God works in the stories of, of these five. And uh, so anyway, we'll get started and I'm going to let everybody kind of introduce themselves. Um, and maybe just uh, we'll, we'll start out with, uh, let's see, we'll go, we'll go in order. We'll, we'll start out with Foster. And uh, anyway, each of you, if you'll just kind of tell us who you are, what church you're serving, and uh, give us a, a really quick version of your calling story, whether you're calling to, to this particular ministry or, or your first calling into ministry, that sort of thing. So anyway, welcome, Foster. Oh, Foster, I'm very afraid you're on mute again. Yeah, my, my name is Foster Frimpo uh, from Lessington, Kentucky, but originally from Ghana. And I'm with Coerce with Christ Missions, uh, Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Um, we, we are looking forward to all the immigrants who uh, are moved to uh, Lessington to have a fellowship with them. And uh, I, I'm called to this ministry, but we look forward to go beyond Lessington and also uh, carry the fellowship and the new perspective we are having with the gospel back to our foreign countries uh, where we come from so we can uh, use the church as a gospel of Christ for purpose of liberating the people from any cultural or whatever bondage we find ourselves in. Beautiful. So how did you, the pastor tell us you, how did you first feel called into ministry or called to this specifically? 
Well, I've, I've felt the call to ministry long back in Africa, and through I became the I was an elder, and through that I really saw the calling, and I really gave my life to serve God. And the move came for me to relocate to the U.S. And the uh, agreement we ha- I have with God is that immediately I land in the U.S., I'm just going to do your work. So mm-hmm. uh, since I came, that's what I've been doing. I've been leading prayer and uh, intercession with uh, people within their homes. Just as Matthew have started, I did the same thing. And then the move came that I need to uh, pursue for education. So I went to LTS to to learn more so that I can do I can fully do ministry. Beautiful. And that's Beautiful. what led to the launching of Coes of Christ Ministries. That's wonderful. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to Foster here in a second, and I'd like to to uh, introduce Savaskia. Savaskia, please tell us about yourself, your church, and and maybe a little bit of your calling story too, please. Thank you so much. Uh, so again, uh, my name is Savaskia Ray Pope. I'm the pastor of New Century Fellowship Christian Church, and we are located in Louisville, Kentucky. So my calls uh, came, I, you know, I, I accepted Christ when I was nine years old. I was brought up in the church, mm-hmm. and uh, as I grew and, and developed my spiritual gifts, I knew right away that I was called to be a leader in the ministry. And every position uh, that I was put in, I didn't ask for it. Uh, I was always, I was always voted to lead somebody, right? And so my initiation in growing in leadership in the church uh, developed uh, into a nonprofit ministry uh, in which I started leading uh, for about four years. And after leading that nonprofit ministry, I began to uh, discern the uh, the call for uh, teaching for reaching those who had been experiencing church hurt and those who who didn't understand their purpose. And so through those teachings of leadership and in uh, many positions in church, that I was able to take that and hear the voice of the spirit to follow that call, that I was called to uh, a much greater call. And that was to lead people back uh, to Christ. Hmm. Uh, so that they could develop their relationship. And so it made sense that every position that I was in, I was always working directly with a pastor, and I never knew why. (laughs) So I was getting trained, and I didn't know I was getting trained. And so there you have it when I heard uh, the call that that is the level in which God wanted me uh, to serve in that capacity. Fantastic. Thank you, Mm -hmm. Sebastian. Okay, and welcome back to Sebastian here in a second. Caitlin. Caitlin, tell us a little bit about your church and and uh, and yourself and and uh, how you kind of felt God's calling in your life. Sure, thank you. Um, so my name is Caitlin Simpson. I'm currently serving as pastor of New Life in Christ Christian Church, and I think my call story started much like Savaskia when I was young. Um, I uh, grew up in the church. I first told people that I wanted to be a pastor when I was 11. Um, but I also have a a really substantial history of trauma and after being diagnosed with PTSD and learning what it meant to live through that trauma, but to also survive it and continue to heal. I just realized there were probably a lot of people like me who had that kind of trauma and struggled with their faith and struggled to understand, uh, denominations and denominational polity. So Eventually, I found disciples. I did not grow up disciples, but um, once I found it, I realized it gave me a really clear uh, path to seek what I always wanted, which was solidarity and uh, community at the table, Um, and Mm. disciples certainly gives that. So I went to seminary, and I became what is now the fourth generation pastor in my family, and I have continued to try and seek to serve those on the fringes, those who have a trauma history those who've often been told that there's something wrong with them or they're not good enough uh, and to always seek to remind them that like me, they have a place at the table. Mm -hmm. So that's what I seek to continue to do in my ministry is remind people of that. Amen. That's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. We'll come back to Kirsten, Rachel, Rachel Nance Whaler. You want to, you want to offer your story a little bit, please? Mm -hmm. Rachel Nance Whaler. I'm one of the co-conveners at Potluck church in Madisonville, Kentucky. And, um, my call to ministry started when I was about 15 years old, and, and 
saw myself serving in um, existing church preaching in a pulpit, that kind of vision for my ministry. That was all I'd known, all I'd seen. And, um, but this call to start Potluck Church, I can see the roots of it going back to my childhood, growing up in a church that had a communion table that extended out into the people in the sanctuary and the deacons and elders gathering around that table and uh, standing next to a table that they could really um, big enough to, to have a meal on. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but when I was in divinity school uh, preparing to be a minister, one um, Monday, Thursday, we were gathering uh, down in the common room at Vanderbilt's disciples divinity house and we all felt like we should probably go to a Monday Thursday service somewhere, um, but none of us wanted to leave the house. We were tired. <laughs> and so we um, said, well, maybe we could just have our own service here. And somebody said, well, mm-hmm. I've got some bread in, in my apartment. And somebody said, well, I've got some wine. And then someone said, I've got some food and I've got some food. And we pulled it all together and ended up having a meal and then had communion after the meal and then stayed up till late in the night talking theology and really deeply talking about our faith. And, and I chased that experience, that religious experience for years, wanting to recreate that because Mm -hmm. it was, it felt the most true to what Jesus was starting and the way that Jesus um, worshiped with Mm -hmm. the disciples. And it felt um, like it brought things out of me that I wanted to, experience with other people again. And so that kind of started me on a journey of looking for that, that vision again. And then when my daughter was born um, and I was a stay at home mom, I had a long time to think about what that might look like if it were a a worshiping Mm -hmm. community. And so that's Mm -hmm. what started me on this journey. Great. Great. Thank you, Rachel. (laughs) All right, Matthew, Matthew Jeremy. Hi, everybody. Hi. Yeah. uh, My name is uh, Matthew Jeremy. I'm uh, originally from Congo, DRC, because we have two Congo. Mm -hmm. So mine is the DRC Congo. And um, I gave my life, it was a little bit, sometimes I say it's kind of like funny, because uh, I gave my life in Christ by 1999. The reason why I gave my life in Christ that year, it was, uh, we was here a lot about 2000 the year 2000. So by December, I was thinking I was, uh, uh, maybe something will happen at 2000. So mm-hmm. let me put my life straight with Christ. So by December, I gave my life in Christ and still then I still with Christ. Mm-hmm. And uh, my call came at church where I gave my life in Christ. They asked us uh, to pray to God, asking God the reason why he called us. To do what? And uh, I remember it was uh, the youth retreat. And uh, I was praying for that. And uh, when I was sleeping, I saw a dream. God showing me I was walking door to doors. Mm -hmm. Talking about God to people. And uh, when I wake up, I understand I had a call of uh, evangelism. And uh, since then, God started leading me to... When I was in the high school, even in my neighborhood, going to try to call my friends to Christ. And then when I moved here in the U.S., uh, I was at Maryland, and God told me to move out from Maryland. And I was praying, asking God where to go, and God led me at Kentucky. And when I came at Kentucky by 2015, We was doing the family prayers in my house with my wife and kids. And God told me, you are a sentinel. Mm -hmm. He told me, he said, I want you to be in the bridge for your brothers and sisters. And God helped me to understand. We have a lot of people right now, all of the world, who going through a lot of situations just because they are Christians. And God told me to support those people in prayers to pray for them. So that's how I understand the call of uh, the Sentinel ministry. Wow. It's it's inspiring to hear hear all all five of you tell those stories. And 
I'll just say, just just as a, as another one, because I, I guess I'm kind of a, uh, you know, I'm one of the co-conveners with, with Rachel of Potluck Church. And I, I should just say, you know, sometimes God, God's so huge and works in all these different ways. And I'll, and I'll just offer in mine too, which was, I, I had, uh, I was on September 11th, 2001, uh, uh, that afternoon, and I was already, you know, 30, 33 years old by that point, and really had never had much use for the church in my life, although I'd always felt like I was a believer in Christ. Um, but that afternoon, I, I, as I frequently did, I went to go play basketball in the parking lot of a Presbyterian church. I didn't even know what denomination it was or anything, but I was in North Carolina. And, and I went to go play basketball on an outdoor basketball goal in their parking lot. And, uh, and I used to go over there and never even paid attention to the lick to the church. And the sign, on, somebody had changed the, the letters on the sign that, that day, that, by that afternoon. And it said, um, he who angers you controls you. And uh, it said that on the sign. And I thought, wow, that was a bold thing to put up on that sign on the afternoon of September 11th, and I thought, church is, you know, maybe maybe there's something going on in those buildings more than what I had previously given credit for all my life, and I kind of stumbled into the church, and I've kind of sort of stumbled all the way through this whole whole journey, and so um, I'll just, I just wanted to throw in mine, in case anyone who's hearing on, uh, on this call, mine was, I was playing basketball in a parking lot, and it kind of started me on the, on the way into this, so anyway, I took the, took the uh, liberty to, to throw that one in too. I'd like to go back, we'll go back, we'll, we'll go back to Foster for a second. So co-heirs with Christ Missions in Lexington. Um, co-heirs, um, uh, let me find my notes here so I get this correct. Co-heirs with Christ Missions in Lexington. It's a mission-oriented church. Um, and, uh, and, and like Foster talked about, that the, the vision is, is greater than Lexington. Um, uh, but it was launched as an international family house uh, with the primary call to provide a place of worship and fellowship for immigrants and refugees. And uh, it's predominantly Africans. And, uh, and I know that, that things, uh, Foster and I have been friends for some years now, so we've had a few conversations about this, but um, I think you've been kind of surprised at the way God has unfolded your church. Um, maybe not exactly how you saw it going, and uh, so I'd like for you to, to kind of talk about that. What kind of community did you first imagine would be part of, of Co-Heirs with Christ? And, and who is it that, that it serves today? Uh, initially, we were looking at the gospel theme for everybody. Mm -hmm. And by that time, I was uh, new in the U.S., so we opened the doors for everyone, and we... We, we brought the church in the middle ground where everybody can come in and worship. But we want to make it international uh, community. And you can look at the flats. <laughs> but along the line, we realized that still there are differences and uh, people were not, were not feeling comfortable uh, worshiping with Africans. So... <laughs> Uh, that was a surprise. The doors were open for everyone, but we realized that the way we worship, the way we do our things are different, and we we had to focus on the, remove our mind from that big uh, mindset and come down to the immigrants. Yet within the immigrants, another surprise was there were still differences uh, mm -hmm. uh, from a colonial colonialism has caused differences language-wise and uh, uh, denominational-wise. The doors are open to be non-denominational, but uh, when they came in, everybody came with a different mindset and the way they worship was different. Mm. And uh, how do we worship then? So we had to create our own new way of uh, making sure everybody ha gets his own way. And then we stick to the center of making disciples. That one has no doctrine as a command given us to do. Yeah. Hmm. What, uh, uh, so tell us about um, what, does, what does worship look like for you? What, what time of day, of the week, that sort of thing? What's the, what's kind of goes on with co heirs of Christ? What's the normal worship okay. schedule? And... Yeah, the, the normal worship is on have prayer times on Monday, Tuesdays, and Friday, Friday mornings, which is kind of uh, strange. Yeah. 
because uh, most of our people go to work in the oh, evenings. Okay. So the mornings, they are home. And so we come to worship on the Fridays morning and, and have prayer for the community on the Fridays. But uh, normal uh, worship is on Sundays, which is normal for everybody in the morning. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, and in fact, we're recording this on a Friday, and you just finished up a, a, a prayer gathering. Correct? Is that Yes. Yeah. So I'm still in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're so glad you could join us today. Okay. Thank you, Foster. Thank you very much. Sorry. Correct. Uh, the sixth anniversary uh, yes. in November. Correct. November. Yes. We are. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, congratulations. Thank you. The uh, Sebastian Church. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Street Fellowship in, uh, in Louisville is also celebrating an anniversary this month, also its sixth anniversary. So Thank congratulations. Thank you so much. We are so excited. And you yes. said, you know, like, like Foster, it's, uh, it's changed pretty dramatically over the course of the six years, right? I mean, is uh, oh, yes. spaces uh, and, and who comes and that sort of thing. Can you tell us a little bit about that, the journey that the church has gone through over that, you know, that time and the way it It's amazing. Uh, when we first started our church, we were doing what we call a third Friday fellowship once a month. And we had young adult um, men coming in for service. They were exploring their talents. Some were singing, some were playing their instruments. And I didn't know that God was setting me up for a church at that time. We were just coming together in a fellowship, right? Let's get together and let's have some food and let's just share. And a year later, uh, we end up uh, birthing that church. Uh, one little small room that probably owned about 22 people, maybe. <laughs> it was in an office building. And when we started the church, um, our goal was that we were going to reach out to de church, unchurch, unconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of uh, our model. We were going to go find those who were just not in the church, or maybe they were in the church, but they left the church for one reason or another. Uh, so quickly after that, we, we didn't know, you know that we would have an opportunity to expand our ministry, go into a bigger, uh, larger uh, facility which gave us access to more resources, classrooms, fellowship halls, a gym, uh, where that we could do ministry on a greater level. And so, and with that, uh, we saw that the dynamics of our ministry began to change. We saw that we were creating community partnerships uh, that would help us to reach uh, women uh, who were in addiction, women who were in human trafficking, mm -hmm. and that they would become part of our congregation as a whole. So that was one thing. We started building community partnerships. And then as we saw who God was sending to the church beyond that, we received leaders, uh, leaders mm -hmm. that uh, we have been attracting leaders. Leaders. We have five ministers in our church. Uh, leaders who uh, needed to be right and had a call already on their and love them, no matter where they were, but to help them to fulfill their purpose. And so mm -hmm. that's where we see uh, where New Century has changed a lot. So you um, and you've also uh, you've also moved physical locations, right? Where you where you were physical were location. Um, we're probably in a I don't know fifteen thousand square feet facility uh, where we have access to the whole entire building. Mm -hmm. I have an office there. Uh, we're also uh, have our Bible fellowship mm -hmm. there uh, every Thursday, as well as our prayer we have right before Bible fellowship. So how how do you go about, um, you know, not no church can be um, all things for all, all people, of course, right. and choices have to be made. Sometimes it's important to choose what, 
you know, what you're not going to be or what you're not, not going to do as much as it is about what you are going to do. Um, you've certainly been part of discerning what God wants, wants your church to be and what it to not want to be. How, how do you go about discerning that? How do you go about figuring that out? Um, well, pray a lot. Uh, spiritual disciplines, prayer and fasting. Uh, we, we normally do that three times a year with our leadership team. And uh, as we continue to strategically plan where God is leading us and what is the mission of our church, we have been a ship on board and then regathering to see what everybody is hearing. Okay. Are we on one hmm. accord? Uh huh. So we'll come back and share the dynamic of what was happening. Wow, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it is. So, um, so thank you, Savaskio. Caitlin is also in Louisville uh, with New Life in Christ. Uh, New Life in Christ Christian Church is located inside Dismas Charities Dearson House, which is the detention center. And most of the women in the congregation, it was founded in August 2013, and most of the women are serving out the last six months of their incarcerations. Uh, um, so, uh, I, I just, uh, you've had a really busy week, it is seemed. And one of the things we talked about in advance of this call is that you get a little picture of a, a planner's day-to-day -day life. And you, I know you wear a lot of different hats, but but if you weren't on this call right now, what might be going on right now in your ministry? What what would you be doing? What are you, what are you postponing and going to have to squeeze in later in your day because you're on this call right now? What, what kind of stuff would you be doing during the, on a Friday? <laughs> sure. On a typical Friday, um, it tends to be a pretty heavy, be call day for um, residents to call seeking pastoral care. Mm -hmm. um, uh, honestly, one of the primary pieces of the Ministry of New Life in this because they're not allowed to have visitors at the same rate that they could have before. So those phone calls, I think, have become pretty critical because lots of times people are just talking through their grief of not seeing their children or not knowing if their parents are well or safe. Um, and, you know, I think, I think beyond that, we do a lot of planning around trying to keep the community engaged. New Life in Christ Christian Church uh, exists because the community has spent, you know, the last seven years really mm -hmm. leaning in and helping lift up, up the middle. And so Friday is typically a day where I go check the post office box uh, and see, you know, what, what are the items that we've received to sort and then figure out how to get those delivered to the facility and make sure they can get into the hands of residents. Um, so, you know, I think a typical day is really just seeing, you know, what are the resources that we can get to the residents, even though we're not able to go in and spend as much time in the facility as we usually are. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's changed. It's changed dramatically since, uh, yeah, the ministry would have changed dramatically in the last nine months. I can see that. Um, yeah. What, um, um, Rachel, I know that with potluck in, in Madisonville, uh, Kentucky, in Western Kentucky, um, it is fundamental, the pandemic has also fundamentally changed what potluck church is at the moment, too. Maybe you could talk a little, it seems like that, that bumps up a little bit with what Caitlin was saying, totally different kind of church, but again, could you talk a little bit about what the pandemic has, has done to the ministry with potluck? Yeah, we've had to, um, go virtual and uh, you know, the concept of getting together and sharing food is seems too risky and dangerous right now for us to, to do that, especially uh, to open it up to visitors. And so we are looking for ways that we might be able to gather uh, safely, but right now we are just meeting on zoom and um, people are uh, bringing their food and sitting in front of the, the computer together and we we have our same worship our worship experience is is the same other than we're not face to face and there is something powerful jesus knew about um getting together around the same table and sharing oh. the same food and so we are missing that aspect of what we do together but um, mm -hmm. we are looking forward mm -hmm. to the day when we can uh, mm -hmm. longing for the day when we can do that again maybe i'll just ask you both i know this is a little different than what we we talked about in advance but but maybe i would just ask you both like what um uh, because you're you are kind of having to reinvent and, and, and rethink 
uh, what, what's been some of the things that, that uh, you've tried that maybe have not, uh, that you've decided, ah, oh, God wasn't in that or something like that. That isn't what we were supposed to be doing. It may be your favorite mistake type question uh, uh, in trying to like figure out how potluck or, or, uh, or uh, new life in Christ moves forward. Um, have there been some false starts where you've had to say, nah, that wasn't right. We need to do something different. Either one of you. Well, I'd say our, our first false start was way pre pandemic. Uh, when we first got going, I went to mm-hmm. the, um, we went to the pastor here at first Christian Madisonville to, uh, pick his brain and receive his blessing as we started. And um, he immediately offered to invite us into the church building to worship there. And I immediately said no, (laughs) because (laughs) I was concerned that the people that have been hurt by the church, the de-churched, those who've had traumatic experiences in churches would feel um, put off by the church building itself. And so I was uh, imagining us meeting in a place that would be more accessible. and, but oddly, one of the first people who um, came and said they would like to be a part of Potluck Church was wheelchair bound, is wheelchair bound. And all the places that we were looking at that we thought would be more accessible were actually inaccessible to him. <laughs> and so uh, I had to go back to the uh, pastor and say, you remember how I said no to your very generous, kind invitation? <laughs> um, my apologies. May we please take you up on that? And so we ended up going to First Christian, and they hosted us for the first several years. Um, and we were so thankful. We met in a variety of spaces in, in, in their building, and all of them were accessible to him and um, to others who have come, uh, people who use walkers uh, to get around and other mobility issues. And it's just been so uh, nice. So so our, our mistake early on was... Uh, not understanding how accessible God wanted us to be <laughs> and thinking we knew what that meant. So. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I think um, for, for us, you know, we started a campaign that we've called notes of hope, uh-huh. which was a, an opportunity for churches all across the state and to be able to submit notes and letters of encouragement to the ladies as they experience that increased isolation at first I think because we didn't know much about COVID, you know, we really encourage them to submit those virtually, um, just send to an email and then we'll print. But, you know, there was something that I, we realized in that process that would just is impersonal <laughs> with okay. something that yeah. is just typed. Um, and so when we expanded that and said, you know what, send it through snail mail, send us whatever you want. You know, one of the very first batches I received was a huge packet from a youth group. Uh, who drew and colored and designed these really beautiful notes that just said things like, you know, I see you, you're loved. Um, Some, some kids would write their favorite Bible message. And, you know, I delivered those very early on uh, into the pandemic and, and pretty quickly I had uh, lots of women calling me saying, Oh my gosh, I just burst into tears because, you know, I'm seeing this hand drawn thing and it reminds me of my children or the children in my life. And, you know, how special it is to get to hang something like that in my dorm room, you know, what most people would hang on their fridge, you know, it just felt like a piece of home. Um, and that for us was a, a good redirection from a, you know, a, a mistake, right, <laughs> that yeah. we made and just mm-hmm. trying to be safe. But we realized, you know, that we were sacrificing uh, some of the heart and meaning. And mm-hmm. we've really been blown away. People are so creative and what they're sending. And, you know, almost every time I open a big packet, it's just kind of overwhelming the time and energy people have taken to put into something that may seem small, but I know is, is really, it means the world to the residents. So it was a good redirect. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. So uh, thank you both Caitlin and Rachel. Um, I'm talking about that. And so now we'll turn to Matthew and uh, uh, Matthew, uh, you're my newest friend of this batch. And so I'm just getting up to speed myself on, on learning about Sentinel ministry. Um, it's an intercessory ministry that uh, seeks to stand in the breach for the spiritual life of his brothers and sisters in general, but in particular those of the Congolese community, as you mentioned. Um, so uh, maybe um, 
maybe if you would, if you could tell us a little bit about with just getting started with this ministry, I'm sure uh, th it's probably a mix of confidence and anxiousness and fear and, and all those sorts of things. Anyway, could you tell us a little bit about this, about that? What, what brings you the most anxiety about launching into this ministry? Yeah, uh, I was uh, really scared, if I can say like that. Sure. Because uh, in the beginning, I, I had a lot of questions. And uh, I had a certain way I was living my life. And when I get the call about the ministry, it was almost like opposite for what I was thinking about. First of all, mm -hmm. Pastor Foster, no, I don't like people call me pastor. <laughs> That's one thing I really don't like. <laughs> Why? Because uh, in my, my country, pastors become kind of like a bad name. If they call you a pastor, people start to look at you in a certain way. And uh, that was one of the reasons. I, I was so mad about uh, a lot of things around the church from my country. So I was saying by myself, I will not be a pastor. I will not be called pastor. And now when God told me about it, I was not seeing myself on that deep level with Christ. And I was very scared. And also, I didn't know how to do it. When God told me about it, it happened one time. I wanted to pray for the ministry, but I didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I really, it was very uh, scary. I was sharing with Pastor Foster most of the time, and it was very scary for me. You know, I was thinking about what people will say. Because when I moved in at Kentucky, some people look at me and they say, oh, wow. We have uh, another church will be born at Kentucky now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I told them I will not open a church. <laughs> I told them that. And when God spoke to me, I was like, wow. I was not <laughs> thinking on that way. But uh, time going, I had a lot of questions to ask God. And God is responding to me each of those questions. That's wonderful. That's yeah, wonderful. he's is very it was scary in the beginning yeah yeah absolutely because wow. it was like you are going somewhere you don't know <laughs> i can only imagine so so on the flip side of that then what what most excites you now as you're on the start of this on the start yeah, now i'm so excited because i found out god is responding each of my questions I asked God a lot of questions. One of the questions was, why, be, uh, on my view, I was saying it's not important to have another ministry at Lexington. Mm -hmm. Because when I came at Lexington, I found maybe like 10 Congolese churches. Mm. Wow. And I was saying, but just at Lexington. I don't know if it's 10, but it's a lot. Yeah. And uh, I was saying myself, instead to create another one, it's better to go support those churches. And I remember one of my friends told me when he saw me with Pastor Foster, he said, I know you people, you start with that pastor and then you will open a church. By looking, it's better don't open a church, just start, stay with that pastor, support his ministry. So what excited me is, God is answering me all of my questions. I mm -hmm. asked him why I have to start a new ministry. And he answered me that question. I asked him how to do it. I want to know how I have to do it. Because he asked me telling me, I, I didn't ask you to start a ministry to go to take some people from others' ministry. Mm -hmm. But I want you to start a ministry to get new people in Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just that phrase God told me about it, I was like, all right, now I understand. <laughs> because one of my, my scary time, I was thinking about my relationship with other Congolese pastors. Because I have uh, some of them, I'm in the good relationship with them. And uh, starting a new ministry, I don't know how they will react about it. Because maybe they will say, oh, now he's coming, taking people from us. Yeah. So yeah. that's 
was a time was scaring me a little bit, but I thank God he's answering me all of my questions. He's leading me, telling me, I had a call about the Sentinel ministry, but I didn't know where it would be. Because when I moved in at Kentucky, I really didn't like Kentucky. And uh, my vision, I was telling my wife, I take my degree uh-huh. and we move out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when God told me about the Sentinel ministry, my question was, where you want me to put that ministry? <laughs> In my mind was coming from California. Yeah. Because yeah. I was doing a computer science and you know, California with a computer science is a right, good money. Right. So, but God told me, I call you for Lexington. <laughs> so it was a lot of questions I was asking God. So I'm so excited because he's answering me all of those questions. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you, Matthew. It's interesting to hear how, uh, you know, such different people and, uh, and, and, and what, five different stories here that we've heard, five different churches and five different people. Um, but how um, you can hear echoes of the same God throughout each one of these stories, right? I mean, there it's, the, as I hear each of you kind of talk this through, um, there's this common thread that's being pulled through. So the stories together kind of testify. Somebody who's a a good preacher could write could write a sermon that would pull this all the way through. I think. Um, so I'll just ask as we as we head toward the, the the end of this conversation, I'll ask you how you know, each of you and just weigh in as you want to. Um, how can we pray for you or your, or your churches? Uh, those of us who are on this call, how can we pray for your churches? How can we pray for you? Well, so I would say that uh, we are in one of a transitional period uh, mm-hmm. with, a, with the space that we share with another church. And uh, we need to prepare uh, what that future is going to look like. Uh, we, we won't go away. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just don't know what the space will look like in the future, whether we will remain there uh, or whether there will be another space provided for us. Okay. So if you can be in prayer with this. All right. Uh, what Thanks that so looks like. Mm-hmm. That up. Amen. When ours is a simple prayer, which is, um, what does God want of us now in this pandemic time? Uh, how to be potluck church now? So um, it, we're we're feeling like we're starting again, almost that we're rebuilding mm-hmm. from with a new new set of circumstances. And so our prayer is just for a greater vision. Amen. Thank you, Rachel. Anyone else? How can we pray for you or your church? Yeah, I, I will. I will say, um, we we want to, and that's been my prayer. I have a, I had my project also tailored towards that how to be the church, as a people. Though we are Africans, we are from different backgrounds, different uh, over thousands of uh, mm-hmm. ethnic groups and uh, different levels of education, different doctrines, and uh, some are so strong. And how can we be the church Mm -hmm. uh, to keep the center of the core of the gospel and be the church for today and the future? So uh, that's my prayer that we will see the church body. We have big talented members and uh, Mm -hmm. God-fearing members, but how we will all be able to hold the center and serve the community is what is led. So I ask for prayer that God will uh, help us see the core of the mission of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Foster. I think for New Life in Christ Christian Church, you know, for so many of us, this pandemic has resulted in uh, increased isolation, but you know, the incarcerated community is already isolated. And mm-hmm. so when you add on to that, um, the level of quarantine that this pandemic has caused it just, it increases, I think the risk of, um, loneliness. And mm-hmm. so many of the, the members of our congregation, you know, are already experiencing deep grief and shame 
or uh, decisions that they've made or situations that they've been in or relationships that their actions have impacted. And so much of their time um, in that final uh, period of incarceration is really spent making amends um, and preparing for what it means to release back into the community. And so I just would ask for prayers that um, for the women who aren't able to have that in a, in, in a you know, quote unquote normal way because of that increased isolation that they still are able to remember how loved and worthy yeah. they are. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and that those relationships waiting for them, though they may not be perfect, they're still there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that God is still with them through that process. I just would ask for prayers for that because I know they need it. Thank you, Caitlin. Amen to that. Matthew, how can we pray for Sentinel? Are you? Yeah. Uh, one of my scary time is uh, to be this person who will people away from God. Hmm. Like we call in French, Pierre de Chopin. That means you are the reason why someone get mad is say I will never pray again. Mm. So that's I all the time when I received the call, I was be scared about it. And uh what will ask for you pray for me and the Sentinel ministry to ask God to help us to stay on the right path. Huh. And not move out from that path. If God can help, you know, I share with the foster. Sometimes when you you shoot, you don't pay attention. When you move out, you don't pay attention. Yeah. So support us, asking God to help us to not go out from His way, to not be this ministry who will make like people decide to not pray because there is a scandal happening. Uh-huh. Right. Not be right. the person of of scandal. Right. That is my prayer. I'm thinking of it. It reminds me of uh, what I'm really outside my depth, but uh, the Hippocratic oath: do no harm. You know, it's some kind of do no harm type thing. That's a that's a good place to start, right? It's just yeah. not lead people away. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. Amen. Amen, Matthew. All right, I'm going to uh, ask you to join me in prayer as we close today. Lord, thank you so much for um, this chance to be together with uh, these five friends, but also everyone who's on uh, listening to this recording. And we pray that um, our gathering, all of our gathering today, has made you smile. Um, and we thank you for um, the people who've called together this uh, regional assembly, and but we also stand on the shoulders of people that, for example, allow us to gather virtually and people who built the the technologies that enabled us to to be able to connect today. And thank you for the miracle of the church in all of its different forms. Um, And um, to to share this beautiful ministry. Let's pray specifically um, for Savaskia and New Century Fellowship. And as they continue to work through this transition, uh, what their space is going to look like. And we're so excited about what you're going to do with that. Um, and, uh, anyway, just pray for energy around that and clarity. And we thank you so much for the work that Savaskia and New Century Fellowship is doing, um, in and around Louisville. And Rachel, I thank you for Rachel and, uh, Potluck Church in Madisonville and, um, uh, what, um, as it discerns new steps, the next steps forward and, and what it looks like to be potluck church, this particular version of church in these pandemic times with the limitations that, that brings on us. But we know you can redeem anything and we know you will redeem us. And um, uh, anyway, we thank you for, for what's going to happen next there. And uh, thank you for her and for potluck. And thank you for Foster and for co-heirs in Christ missions. And we celebrate the anniversary, uh, their anniversary as well, Savaskia and New Century Fellowships. We, we celebrate that anniversary. And uh, uh, it's so beautiful what Foster um, and New and Co-Heirs in Christ Mission is doing in Lexington in terms of bringing these people of very different uh, cultures and backgrounds and doctrines and practices and uh, uh, bringing them together and, and trying to hold that middle and share a common core and see the Jesus in each other. And we just pray for 
uh, more success there. And we're excited about what you're doing through co heirs of Christ. So thank you. And Lord, I thank you for Caitlin and uh, New Life in Christ. And um, the, um, we pray specifically today for, for our incarcerated sisters and brothers and the isolation we know that they feel anyway, but even more keenly that they're experiencing right now. And pray that there is an inbreaking and that they feel you through those walls and know that they are loved and, and send more people to carry that, to, to be the personifications of that love around them. Um, um, anyway, we just thank you for what you do through New Life in Christ and through these letters of hope and pray that the, the women um, uh, feel that, uh, that it leaves a mark, that that love leaves a mark. And uh, thank you. Thank you for that ministry there. And Lord, we thank you for Matthew. And we're so excited about Sentinel and what it's doing. And uh, we're so impressed with the gifts that you have given um, Brother Matthew um, and uh, uh, this journey and his openness to this journey, which continues to, to kind of surprise him. And, um, but that he's willing to adjust to his, to your plan for him and to hear that. And we thank you for that. And, um, we just pray that, that that continues to be the case and, um, that he stays, um, right where you want him to be. And we thank you for Matthew and we thank you for Sentinel. And I thank you for everyone on this call and how you use different people um, in inventive ways. And I thank you for the, the standing churches um, across Kentucky and really throughout the world. But today we're talking about Kentucky. I thank you for those standing churches and the work that they have done over the years and the support that they provide in finding new ways to bring Christ to new people um, that call never ends. And I pray that we just stay um, open to, to those planters um, and potential planters or the people that fund them. Um, and um, we, just, we just look forward to what you do um, in the hearts of the people that are listening right now. Um, it is in Christ's name I pray. Thank you for all these friends. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, okay, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Uh, Savaskia and Rachel, I would just ask, so somebody who's, who's hearing on this call and is, is feeling more encouraged as opposed to discouraged, I'm kind of thinking of Matthew's prayer and, and kind of thinking, gosh, I thought I was on the right side of this. But anyway, I hope I wasn't more of a hindrance to somebody than a, than a help. But if, if somebody is feeling called maybe toward new church ministry and want to kind of talk that through, um, could you talk a little bit about how you engage with the denomination with you two? What, what should someone do next? Well, I'll just share that Rachel and I were both co conveners. Honestly, she does a lot of heavy lifting, <laughs> but we both worked together cohesively in making sure uh, that we provide that opportunity for them to bring uh, that vision, that dream of starting a new church. We have a website out on our regional site for new church ministry for them to connect. It has all of our contact information. And we would just love, either one of us, we would love to have a conversation with them and get them connected to our team. Uh, as you can see, there is a lot of vision, uh, a lot of excitement, a lot of God's spirit uh, moving through these new churches. And we are excited. And guess what? Even if you don't want to plan a new church, how about coming and joining us and helping us to, to go through these processes and, and help develop this on a greater level? That's what I would have to say. How about you, Rachel? <laughs> that, that's all that's great. I want to add that we have a Facebook page, the CCK uh -huh. New Church Ministry Team Facebook page, where you can follow all of our churches and get to know um different opportunities for training and for connection. Um, we meet quarterly, all of us, and, and support each other. And along with, I want to also add Kentucky Islanders Christian Church in here, Pastor Bradley. Uh, we're, we are partners on this journey, so we, we lift each other up and pray for one another and share our worries and 
um, share opportunities we find for one another. Um, and also there's information there on the regional website, ccinky.net. If you go to ministries and then down to new church, there's information there about our grants, our three tiered grant program and Barnabas covenants and other opportunities where you can come and, and join us in worship. So, um, mm -hmm. all that information is there and, mm -hmm. and we'll connect you, uh, with us and with our regional staff to, to get things going. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sebastian and Rachel. Mm -hmm. And the two things that I did forget to, to mention, I'm so glad, Rachel, thank you for, for mentioning Pastor Bradley and, uh, and, uh, and the church Walton. And, um, uh, but I also wanted to mention that uh, so many of the questions that we talked through today, uh, giving credit where credit is due, that, that's come from uh, a, a book called The World Cafe uh, by Juanita uh, uh, Brown and David Isaacs. And so I just wanted to mention that. They're unwitting help today. <laughs> they didn't know they were helping, but they did. So anyway, thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, thanks for listening. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.